Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for turning out in such great numbers on such a lovely day. It's one of the few days when you should all be home cutting your grass or doing something like that uh, because it's, we've had such a bad uh, summer. But we're so honoured indeed to be here this evening in the presence of the Chief Justice um, uh, to launch this, um, if I may say so, really excellent publication, European Criminal Justice Post-Lisbon and Irish Perspective. Um, the Chief Justice is going to formally launch the book for us. Now, Susan Denham is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and precisely one year ago, today, she was appointed to that position. So today is her birthday. <laughs> and, a, and a very healthy one-year-old, you're looking, Chief Justice. Um, she, she was the first woman to ever hold this position. And a quick uh, run through the senior positions in, law, in the legal profession in this country uh, shows now, I think, five positions held uh, by women. The Chief Justice, the Attorney General, the DPP who's here, the uh, Chief State Solicitor and the Head of the Parliamentary Drafts Office. Uh, all women. So it's a very nice uh, tribute to pay to the women of Ireland that they have at last been recognised in their talents. Uh, Susan Denham, as you probably all know, was educated here in Dublin at Alexandra College, Trinity College, King's Inns and Columbia University. And she was also pro-chancellor of Trinity College in Dublin. Now, she's a long distinguished career as a uh, practising both junior and senior counsel and uh, did a nice uh, stint in the Midland Circuit, which I'm sure was a very interesting, <laughs> a very interesting period of her life and uh, because the best stories come from that circuit. Um, and then in 1992, she was again the first woman to be appointed to the Supreme Court. I was very honoured indeed that Susan agreed in 1995 to take the chair of the working group of, on a court's commission. And I see uh, a few people who were around here at that time when we set up that uh, working group. The it was the first real look at our courts since they were founded in 1923. So it was really um, a kind of a, a magical time. And Susan chaired that and pre um, presented several reports outlining significant reform in the organisation of our courts since the foundation of the states. And it led to the establishment of the court service. Then Susan, in turn, was on the interim board of the actual service and, uh, uh, court service and served on that board from 2001 to 2004. Most recently, she was chairing the working group on a court of, of appeal. And now the current minister has announced that there's going to be a referendum. Don't please ask me when. Uh, but there's going to be a referendum on, on changing our court structures as well. So Susan Denham has been a really significant person in the life of this country with regard to our courts, the improvements, the modernisation of it. I don't need to tell you that, of course, her, this is terrible, but her father was the former editor of the Irish Times, Douglas Gageby, and her brother is a practising uh, criminal barrister, Patrick Gageby. But I also know that Susan likes to spend a little bit of time down in Connemara, walking the roads there, where she's probably thinking about the next sentence or the, <laughs> or the next uh, issue that's going to come. And believe me, at the moment, there's some very interesting cases just entering into court at the moment. You're not allowed to say anything, Alan. Um, entering into court at the moment. Um, I want to just uh, acknowledge, if I can, um, the IEA for this work, but I want to acknowledge all the contributors. Eugene will talk about them uh, in a few, few minutes. We particularly are privileged to have the contribution of the United States Attorney General, Eric H. Holder, who himself kind of was in the eye of a political storm recently where the Republicans were trying to kind of throw him off centre and accuse him of all sorts of things. But he withstood it. He was a really uh, great speaker and a charming man. We particularly want to acknowledge the contribution of Eugene Regan, who's here today. And thank you, Eugene, for being here, uh, particularly after your really sad bereavement and your lovely two daughters. We also could not have done any of this without the work of Jill Donoghue. Um, Jill is the Director of Research here at the Institute, and honest to God, she is incredible. She just never seems to stop. Joe Brosnan, former General Secretary of the... Secretary General, that's a really slip up. A General Secretary is trade union, but a Secretary General is a department um, uh, of the Department of Justice, and he peer-reviewed the chapters. And Brian Martin and Mike Mahan, 
um, known in the IEIEA's creative team for their exceptional work in bringing the publication to fruition, and a very elegant publication it is. And I particularly want to pay tribute to somebody who can't be with us here tonight, that's Katrina Heinel. Katrina has been the kind of the worker behind this whole group, the Justice and Home Affairs group, the main researcher. And she's currently in Singapore, so we didn't think the Institute could stretch to two return tickets for her to come over and go back again for the launch. So she's here in spirit and she can watch it on whatever clever website or something you set up. Um, but there was a lot of work that went into this book, and a, particularly by the, uh, by the writers. And if I could be forgiven for just mentioning two bits of it that I think you know, came into its own um, in, this, in this publication. I've been very strong on the whole issue of data protection. It raises its ugly head everywhere you go. And Billy Hawks, whom I know well from a previous life where he nearly saved my life in a small baby plane, um, Billy is now um, reminding us, all of us, no matter what area of work you're working in, data protection now has to be looked at and be mentioned and examined. No point in saying, oh, nobody will care about that. And of course, one of my babies, the Criminal Assets Bureau, it's um, now... Like the example that's been used, and I write Eugene, all over the world, people, I, I don't know how they get any work done because I think every other day there's some visitor from some country coming in to see how we started and established it. And if I could say so, it was probably one of very few instances when Dahl Aaron actually worked properly and effectively and got something done in the shortest possible time that is working so well. And I mean, if people want an example of how our parliamentary system should work. Maybe they should look at that. I know what led to it. It was the tragedies of two heinous murders. But nonetheless, it's a very good example of showing if the members of the parliament work together, they can get something out. So I'm going to pass over now to our Chief Justice, Susan Denham, who's going to say a few words for us, and thank you again. Thank you very much indeed for those kind words. I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, I'm delighted to be here with all of us uh, as we join for the launch of the European Criminal Justice Post-Lisbon and Irish Perspective. This book is a timely publication um, coming in advance of Ireland assuming the presidency on the 1st of January. Uh, and it's an absolutely wonderful collection of opinions uh, of experts who are giving us their expertise. The um, publication um, has been produced by this Institute of International and European Affairs Justice Steering Committee, and there is no doubt that the um, Institute is a leading policy research institute on European and international affairs uh, in Ireland, and it's an independent not-for-profit organisation with charitable status, which gives it a particular and unique status. Its extensive research programme seeks to provide its members with high-level analysis and forecasts of the challenges which we are uh, going to meet in global and European policy agendas, uh, which uh, will impact on Ireland. It aims to act as a catalyst for new thinking, new solutions, and policy options. And this publication is an example of a success in achieving that aim. This is the product of the Justice Steering Committee, a neutral forum bringing together experts to discuss and examine issues of national, European, and international importance in law and justice, where it monitors the implications of developments in the EU area of freedom, security, and justice. The Steering Committee is therefore a reflective group of experts, a very useful uh, institution in our society. Uh, with an eye to Ireland's presidency um, beginning in January, such a national body of experts engaged in these policy areas enriches our whole national debate. Those who work in the justice sector in Ireland are indebted to the work of the Institute in elucidating complex areas of law which have an ever-increasing European and international element in our society. The committee, of course, is chaired by Nora Oon, who is the second woman to be appointed uh, Minister for Justice and with whom I worked, as Nora said, um, with great pleasure during the 1990s and we managed to get a number of very important projects up and running and it was a very important time for me too, Nora. Um, and, you know, it's very important that this innovative work that uh, Nora did as a minister 
is continuing as she brings her expertise now into this institute and shares with it and leads it. I agree with uh, your sen sentiments expressed at the beginning of the book that the constructive suggestions, support or criticism offered by the contributors are levelled ultimately at improving the livelihoods of our citizens and securing the right of the individual in all jurisdictions throughout the globe, not just in Ireland, uh, to safety and freedom from the ripple effects of crimes, which of course know no boundary or border. And when we look at this wonderful publication and uh, we think about the Lisbon Treaty, and of course I can say nothing about the Lisbon Treaty because we are in the middle of all kinds of interesting litigation at the moment. Um, we must remember that the history of the Lisbon Treaty and the European Union is rooted in those ashes of World War II. And as time passes, it's often easy to forget the essential truth of our union. And, you know, I'm very fond of looking back at Robert Schumann's declaration where he starts uh, by saying... World peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the degree which threatens it. The contribution which an organised and living Europe can bring to civilization is indispensable to the maintenance of peaceful relations. Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create a de facto solidarity. And although we've seen great development in Europe over the last few decades, we're 27 nations, 500 million people, and it is quite a unique project, the debate that goes on and the steps that go on, there are a few steps forwards, maybe one back, but they're all small achievements towards ultimately uh, the vision that was elucidated uh, in the 1950s by Robert Schuman and others. Now, the project leader of the steering committee uh, is Eugene Regan, uh, who has edited this publication. And he has developed a wealth of expertise, of course, going right back to Peter Sutherland's cabinet and his later work. And I'd like to congratulate him on bringing to fruition this excellent legal resource, which will be much examined by policymakers, legal practitioners, academic lawyers, and all interested citizens in our union. In the introduction of the book, he notes that the creation of an area of freedom, security and justice within the Union is for the first time defined in the Lisbon Treaty as a shared competence between the Union and the Member States. And he points out that this represents an acceptance by the Member States that if they are to effectively combat serious crime, which invariably has a cross-border element at national level, they can do so more effectively by working together at a European level and with the full involvement of the European institutions. And that's so much what this book is addressed to in individual specific areas of the individual experts. Uh, Mr. Egan also provides us with the most interesting and informative overview of criminal justice post-Lisbon in Chapter 1, charting the beginnings of the treaty to the present day. And it's noteworthy that he points to the area of freedom, security and justice as being the signal achievement of the heads of government in the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, this excellent publication sheds light on aspects of the treaty and its implications for criminal justice across the European Union with particular references to Ireland. And I would like to compliment each of the authors for contributing to our shared knowledge of what is often a very challenging area of the law. Brian Purcell, uh, Secretary General of the Department of Justice, has written on criminal justice cooperation in Ireland, opt-in protocol. And this is really a very helpful discussion in a complex area, uh, including on the facility for opting into individual measures, Protocol 21. At the time of writing, the Department of Justice and Equality had, when he was writing, had dealt with 22 measures to which Protocol 21 applies, all of which are helpfully appended in tabular format at the end of his chapter. Uh, Ireland has, in fact, adopted for 18 of these. And you know, this kind of information is so hard to find. It's an absolutely wonderful resource. Commissioner of Angardia Shukona has written on police cooperation and security in the EU. Commissioner Callanan examines the role of our police force in the European Union and security cooperation following Lisbon. And as Commissioner points out, the EU and international police cooperation is an increasingly essential aspect of national policy. And he makes the very interesting and very important point that, of course, it's 
a, a, an amazingly beneficial factor that in Ireland that we have a national police force on Garda Síochána and that we don't have multiple police forces because it's so complex dealing with other jurisdictions where you have the Metropolitan Police and you have a variety of other police forces. Um, the Commissioner notes that Ireland's forthcoming presidency will include chairmanship of elements of the Europol Management Board in cooperation with Lithuania and Greece. Uh, our former DPP, James Hamilton, has written a chapter entitled Prosecuting Crime, the European Context, and he outlines the role of the EU in assisting the effective prosecution of crime at national level, uh, the role of legal instruments such as uh, the European Arrest Warrant. Last week, uh, we published uh, the uh, report of the court service uh, for 2011, and it shows that there were 414 European arrest warrant applications in the High Court in 2011, which was a 9% decrease, but there was 1,368 orders made uh, in the European arrest warrant cases in Ireland uh, for going out. So a 21% increase in 2000. And it's very interesting, uh, very busy. As you know, we have to have dedicated judges dealing with it at the moment. Uh, uh, there's a very informative uh, account of the development of European criminal law uh, given by Mr. Hamilton. And he also has an interesting discussion on the, the civil and common law systems. He um, points out that really, when you think about civil law, there's a bit of precedent. And when you're thinking about criminal, uh, our, our common law, you know, we have our statutes. And so he makes the point really very well. Uh, that the truth, in spite of all our different origins, is that there's no pure civil or common law systems, but they're all mixed to a greater or lesser degree. A very informative article and very well worth reading, even on the wider context, rather than also the specific area he's contacting. Detective Chief Inspector Eugene Corcoran um, of CAV um, writes a, a very informative article on Criminal Assets Bureau, a case study for Europe. And as Nora said, of course, it's one of our great successes. And, um, and we have, and gather, whenever I go to conferences, I'm always being told, we've got your Garda Shikona here, they're explaining to us all about it. It's a wonderful system. So it's really been a great thing for Ireland that we have led in this way and shown this absolutely excellent multidisciplinary agency model, uh, which is now being copied in so many other parts of Europe. Our uh, retired Attorney General, and Francis Kiernan, um, wrote on judicial protection in the EU. Uh, they outlined the structure of judicial protection in the EU and the differing approaches of the member states to the rights of the individual. They started way back, Magna Carta, and moved forward. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's a really informative uh, article, and I am sure that uh, all the, the young barristers and solicitors and academics will um, hone in on it immediately. And of course, they point out that membership of the EU doesn't mean that all countries must have identical values in the fields of criminal law and pr procedure, but that there are certain minimum rights which are the subject of judicial protection in all member states. It's the most informative and useful um, article. Uh, Mr. Billy Hawkes has, as um, Nora said, written on data protection and citizens' rights in the fight against serious cr cross-border uh, crime. This is impinging, of course, on all our lives. Um, uh, we, wherever you move uh, now, it's a very critical aspect of um, decisions, um, even when one isn't aware of it. And to some extent, perhaps, um, you know, it's, it's creeping in, and we have to have much more awareness of it. And I'm extremely pleased that this article is there. I had, um, uh, you know, it was just brought to my attention a couple of years ago, we were hoping to put online a whole series of sentences that had been made in the court, in open court, after an open hearing, uh, and um, we just wanted to put them up for the judges and practitioners to look at, and so be able to see what the circuit court is doing in this area and what the district court is doing in that area. And we re immediately ran into the data protection, which said now, although it was an open court, and although it was all in the public domain, and although there are public <coughs> documents, I'm afraid you can't put it up on the website in that format, so they all had to be anonymized, and of course, anonymizing cases just took time. But I mean, it really pulled me up to think, you know, we must be so aware of how important um, 
this uh, change in our society is and how uh, the balance has to be struck between the various interests that have to be considered. Um, Eric Holder, Attorney General of the USA, has written on advancing common priorities, combating crime and ensuring global security through international partnership. I was delighted to be here last year when he was here and he spoke and um, he has pointed out that partnership between the US and the European Union is central to uh, the common goal, stating that as transnational organised criminal networks and cybercrime have transcended national boundaries, so too must we uni be united in combating these threats. It was a most interesting uh, speech he gave here, and it's excellent to have it in this collection. So the contributors are all to be congratulated for their detailed and informative, very learned chapters, uh, which obviously have involved very careful preparation. They're a very synthesised uh, exercise in knowledge. And they will be a really a great asset to the national conversation. I congratulate to all involved in this um, project, both the writers and I compliment the staff of the institute for all their work. Managing and getting something like this together is very hard work. It can be said with certainty that the institute lives up to its guiding motto, sharing ideas, shaping policy. This is an important and timely publication and it gives me great pleasure to officially launch European Criminal Justice Post-Lisbon and Irish Perspective. Thank you, Chief Justice, for those kind words. Um, I also think it's a good book. Um, I think we got it right. Um, we tried to keep it short, but I think it's comprehensive. Um, in fact, I think my chapter is the longest. I broke the rules, having, <laughs> having suggested they be at a certain length. Um, there's a lot of information in the book, but I think it's easy to read. Um, I think it's suitable for the expert um, in the area of criminal law and Europe, uh, but I think it's also suitable for and helpful to those who are unfamiliar with the subject matter, uh, whether it is data protection or uh, policing or otherwise. Um, <clears throat> I think the book is opportune, as the Chief Justice has said. Uh, I think that's very important at this particular juncture, not only because of the major changes that are introduced by the treaty, um, but also the Irish, forthcoming Irish presidency, when a lot of the issues in this area and legislation which is uh, going through the system will come to for final determination during the Irish presidency. Um, but more particularly, this opt-out or opt-in and the, um, the three-year review of Ireland's opt-out from uh, EU criminal law and policing measures, which was um, introduced um, mm. at, the, at the last moment before the um, signing off on the Lisbon Reform Treaty. I think also um, <clears throat> some recent decisions of the Supreme Court in the area of extradition, one in relation to, to extradition to France and, and the, the more recently in relation to Hungary, have highlighted a num first of all the area, the cooperation that's going on in this area uh, between member states. It's also highlighted perhaps some flaws in the formulation of the framework directive on the arrest warrant, perhaps some flaws in how we have transposed it uh, in Irish legislation. And also the um, problem, uh, and it has been highlighted in the uh, Supreme Court, by the Supreme Court, uh, some of the justices in relation to not being able to refer um, a matter of interpretation in relation to that your arrest warrant for interpretation by the European Court. That's all been resolved um, by and large by the Lisbon Treaty. Um, this publication, as uh, has been said, is by people who are expert in their areas um, and responsible uh, for their areas. They're speaking at, from first-hand knowledge uh, and I think that comes through in the chapters. Um, <clears throat> it's both in the formulation of criminal law policy, in the investi detection, investigation, and prosecution area, uh, and in the area of the protection of fundamental rights, whether it is in, um, in the courts uh, or in um, uh, the, the, the uh, transposition of EU directives or otherwise. Um, I think it also gives, and I hope it gives, a clear picture of the actions which have been undertaken in all of these areas uh, and um, throws insight, gives an insight into uh, just what is happening 
um, at a European level and how the actors at national level are interacting with the um, players and the institutions at a European level. The objective really is to provide that insight and through that insight to serve as a guide to policymakers um, and legal pr practitioners. The background <coughs> to the publication, as the, um, um, Susan Denham has just said, is that this whole fundamental principles upon which Europe is based. Um, originally very much, while politically based, it was an economic community. And more and more that area of that recognition of the importance of the rule of law, democracy, fundamental rights. Um, then the creation of an area of freedom, security and justice, which sums up that objective. And I think the Lisbon Treaty provides a much better framework than has ever existed uh, to translate those principles into reality. Um, in particular, it's the first time that Europe uh, has um, been acknowledged as having a shared a competence in the area. Um, for a long time, member states did not want the institutions at all involved in criminal law matters. Um, now it is a shared competence, and that's treaty-based. Um, so there is an acceptance by member states uh, that they can work more effectively within that European framework. The Court of Justice uh, has full oversight from 2014. The European Commission will have the normal enforcement powers. Um, we have infringement proceedings against member states in a lot of areas for failing to transpose directives, um, but not in this area, uh, because the European Commission doesn't, at the present time, have that authority. With Lisbon, it does, uh, uh, from 2014. Um, and of course, we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is uh, fun, uh, part of the Lisbon Treaty, which plays very much in this area. Because if you have European institutions like Europol and Eurojust playing a greater role uh, in uh, uh, criminal law matters and policing matters, prosecution issues, then it has to be flanked by greater accountability and legitimacy. And that can only come with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the recognition of the role of the European Commission and co-decision by the European Parliament. Um, the, it is interesting to note that our involvement in this whole area, it was in the Convention on the Future of Europe, uh, which um, ultimately led with some amendments to the Reform Treaty. There was a working group, 10, on uh, criminal law matters and justice matters, chaired by John Bruton. And it was that group that uh, uh, decided that there had to be radical changes in this area so that the institutions would play a greater part uh, and that you would have, in particular, qualified majority voting. You wouldn't have this unanimity requirement. And it was from that committee that, uh, and, and the report from that committee, which is laid the basis for the section on um, criminal law matters and policing. Um, and of course, the fundamental change was the qualified majority voting. And of course, that created a concern in Ireland in relation to, uh, and of course in the United Kingdom, as to the threat that might pose to our criminal justice system, um, and therefore the opt-out. I uh, don't say that logically follows. I just say that that is what created the concern. Um, the, a few words about the individual chapters, and I think that the Chief Justice has highlighted a lot of the um, important points. But I, I would say that the chapter by Brian Purcell in relation to the opt-out, it's clear, factual, non-judgmental, and it is the perfect chapter, perfect piece for anyone who's going to examine this area and decide, do we really need this opt-out? Would we, by not having this opt-out by be participating in the formulation of policy from day one have a bigger influence on the procedures and the style of a directive, which would be more compatible with our common law system. Uh, we faced all of these issues before in other areas and found by the operating and working with Europe, with the Commission, in the qualified majority system that we could get the changes we wanted. I think it's a stumbling block myself. I 
did raise it in the Senate as early as 2008. I never agreed with it, but I can see how, why uh, there, it was uh, established. But I think it is decision time now as to whether we continue with that, that opt-out. Um, on the um, Martin Callanan and the Garda Commissioner, uh, Chapter 3, um, I think the one thing that comes across is just how embedded we are in the European system, how the work of the Garda Shikona is very much linked with the work of Europol, which was took quite a while to um, get established. I think it was that uh, film with Catherine Zeta-Jones as she walked across the podium and Europol in banner headlines. I think that's <laughs> probably what broke the ice. But, they, but um, in reading that chapter, you, you read about European analytical work files and strategic overviews by Europol, which is pretty critical, I think, to the work. I think the other point that comes across is just how complex the structures are. And one can only, if one looks at the the table on the Euro policy cycle and those other tables and diagrams in your chapter which are uh, highlight just what you're dealing with. I think what's also interesting is you've highlighted specific areas where the interaction and the cooperation with Europe has worked and given rise to results, whether it's on drug interceptions, uh, Euro you know, counterfeiting or uh, terrorist issues, human trafficking in particular. Um, former DPP James Hamilton, I think, has produced a very nice think piece on this whole area of prosecution. And I think the Chief Justice highlighted the point I wish to highlight, and that is that point you make about convergence, that there is actually a convergence emerging of our criminal, uh, of our civil and common law systems. And I suppose it didn't, it didn't start yesterday. There has been an evolution over a period of time, but I think you've highlighted one very crucial point, and I think that, um, I think it is in that spirit that we can work with the common civil law systems uh, and ensure that there is no transgression on what the principles of our own system which we uh, value. Um, Eugene Corcoran on the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the Criminal Assets Bureau and the um, forfeiture. Now, there's quite a number, um, Chief Justice mentioned uh, history of, uh, I don't know which chapter you were speaking about, but the chapter on um, the Criminal Asset Bureau and civil forfeiture, I think it's a very nice uh, introduction piece, a historical piece on how this whole procedure has evolved. It's an excellent chapter, shows just how successful uh, the Criminal Assets Bureau has been and how Ireland has played a big part in that, um, highlighting the, um, the, the establishment of this Camden Asset Recovery Interagency Network, CARN, and it started, it started here. And I think it's a very interesting um, model which we've established. And um, I think I've no doubt it'll feature during the Irish presidency. Paul Gallagher and Francis Kiernan, uh, Kiernan in, uh, in, on the issue of judicial protection in the European Union, they, highlighting the diversity among member states in the protection of uh, fundamental rights. Uh, and in the, the different criminal uh, procedures in member states, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, how that feeds into it, and of course, Europe's accession to the European Convention of Human Rights. And in particular, I think it's a very nice think piece, again, on that whole issue of mutual uh, recognition, mutual respect of judicial systems between member states, which is the basis for cooperation in this area. <clears throat> again, I think that was touched on in a recent um, Supreme Court case in relation to that uh, extradition to Hungary uh, and that recognition and acceptance of other legal systems and perhaps uh, the, que the, the questioning of whether one can presume that um, fundamental rights are protected. And then we come to the, um, I'm nearly there, data protection, Commissioner Billy Hawkes. Uh, if one knew nothing about data protection or how it impacts uh, on our lives or how it affects <coughs> police enforcement, uh, uh, criminal law enforcement, um, I think read that chapter. It is an excellent piece on um, the whole issue, uh, the risk of uh, to individual freedom and invasion of privacy without adequate safeguards. Um, and the, it also highlights the legislation which is coming down the line from Brussels, and it's particularly in this area, it will come to the fore during the Irish presidency. So I think that is a a very important issue. Uh, in relation to the Attorney General of the United States, we're very happy to have that 
his chapter included Eric Holder. And we had, a, as the Chief Justice said, a very interesting presentation by him in the, uh, uh, the Institute here. And one thing he emphasized, uh, the partnership with Europe, but in combating international terrorism, highlighting that the importance of safeguarding the commitment to the rule of law and respect for fundamental rights. And I think he, uh, he uh, laid great stress on that, recognizing that perhaps, and I think he acknowledged that the United States had perhaps overstepped the mark in quite uh, a number of areas in that regard. I didn't suggest many changes to his chapter. I mean, after all, he is the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, just for my part, I want to thank Nora as chairperson of the, the Justice Group. She played a critical role in this work, as she always does. And she has that wonderful facility of being able to get people to do things. It's, it's, it's no pressure, just force of personality. It doesn't matter whether it's the data, the guard, the commissioner, or the data protection commissioner. They respond, and they did in this case, as did all of the authors, in providing comprehensive and succinct chapters. Katrina Heinel, Katrina Heinel uh, played a crucial role. She sweet-talked everybody into getting their chapters done, completed, and in on time, and I think she, she really does deserve a lot of credit. And Jill Donahue, the key driver in all of these processes. Uh, and just the Institute itself, I mean, I think it does, the, the publication is a reflection of the commitment of the Institute to stick with producing, uh, hopefully, quality publications on European policy matters. And, you know, they have followed this justice area for quite some time now. We had a publication in uh, 1997, uh, that was the Justice Cooperation of the European Union, and then the new third pillar, which we did in 2000. So I think the uh, Institute have done well on this one, and uh, thank you very much. And thanks. Thank you.